This is Real Sales Talk. Real sales advice from real sales practitioners. Giving you tips on how to dominate your sales quota are your co host Sean Mitchell and Phil Keen. We don't have a process for referrals at most companies. I go into a company, I say, what's your referral process? They have no, well, what do you mean? I think that, I think that goes back to the premise that why do salespeople suck at prospecting? I mean, number one reason why they suck at prospecting is they don't actually do it. If you are successful and nobody knows in, 2000, in 2016, 20, 2025, you're not successful. You ever want to find out what's going on in the company? Get in the car and spend a day with the top three salespeople. You'll find out in five minutes. Because you can't be a trusted advisor without two things, trust and advice. I mean, you need both of them. Can you believe it's season four, episode one? This is this is so crazy for me. I was telling uh, our new co-host, Phil Keen, which I'll introduce here in just a moment for those that have been uh, on another planet and have not listened to Real Sales Talk in, <laughs> in a few weeks, but um, uh, we've got a new co-host and we've got a new format for this. So super excited. was telling Phil a moment ago that I actually got some butterflies. I'm a little bit nervous uh, because it's a little bit of a new format, but uh, nonetheless, super excited and great to jump back in. I know some of you have hit me up on Twitter and Snapchat saying, hey, when, when are we going to get rolling again with a new episode? So uh, here we are and we're going strong today with a really, really cool guest that I'll introduce now, John Barrows, who is a sales coach. He, he's, he's the sales coach. He's the Salesforce sales trainer and among other many, many great companies. Uh, super excited to have you on today. How are you? I'm doing fantastic, Sean, and I appreciate you having me on here. I wouldn't say I'm that super, but uh, <laughs> but I'm, I'm having some fun. So we'll, we'll see what we can do today. Yep. Awesome. Cool. Um, Phil, uh, we, we, you're the new co-host, so I want to say a big welcome to you. It was sad to see Henry leave uh, and yeah. move on to bigger and better things, but um, super excited to have you on so we can kind of take over the world, take over the podcast world. Yeah, hopefully hopefully we can take it to the next level, and I got big shoes to fill with Henry, so it's going to be it's gonna be fun, though. And John, congratulations. You got the inaugural co-hosting episode, even though I've been on twice for Sean. So. No, yes. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm honored. <laughs> so today's topic is professional persistence and your contact strategy. And this is something, John, I know is really near and dear to you. And um, I was fortunate enough about a year ago uh, to sit in on one of your trainings uh, when I was with another company uh, when you came here to Denver. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm super excited to, to get some of your nuggets, uh, really uh, uh, practical nuggets on, on follow-up and persistence so um, let's go ahead and dive in. Uh, everyone's got a unique story about how they got into sales. Uh, some people fall into, to, to fall into sales by accident. Others, they know, you know from a very young age that they're, they're a salesperson. How did you get into sales? What's your story? Yeah, it's the former. I think it's it's like most people. You know, I I didn't know what the hell I wanted to do. I always find it insulting that colleges force you to declare your major at 18 years old. I think that's just ridiculous. So, I went into University of Maryland because um, uh, they didn't force me to do that. Ultimately, got into marketing because I felt like I don't know that was pretty much close enough. My football, well, my first major was art. That was a disaster. Um, and then, you know, so I got into business, um, marketing, got out into the world, realized I uh, don't want to do this and can't make enough money doing it. And so then um, DeWalt or Black & Decker um, is right next to uh, University of Maryland. They recruit heavily out of there. And DeWalt uh, was, was part of Black & Decker. And they recruited me out of that to be in quote unquote sales. But really what it was, was event marketing. It was drive around in a Dodge Ram pickup truck and give away free tools. And you know, there was no quota, there was nothing. And then, so I took that, it was awesome, um, super fun. And then, uh, you ever seen the ice cream truck coming onto a kid's playground? Oh, that yeah. was me for construction workers. So, <laughs> um, so then I went, got promoted from there and went to uh, Home Depot, like still selling DeWalt. And it was a little bit more of an evolution of sales because it was taking what used to be a $10,000 order uh, for a Home Depot store and turning it into a $50,000 order by sell-throughs and end caps and that type of stuff. Then I moved from there to Xerox and that's really where I got my sales training and education. Uh, so I sold to state and local governments here in Massachusetts. Uh, and if anybody's ever been in copier sales, they know exactly how painful that is. 
and how much rejection you take. Uh, and then from there, didn't really, I, I didn't like the corporate feel, even though I didn't know it. I was kind of doing what I was supposed to do like everybody else. And, but it just didn't feel right to me to, to be sitting in two years to wait for a promotion. And it wasn't really based on results. It was based on time. And so a buddy of mine started a company um, out of high school and needed some sales. So I jumped on board, helped him start that. We did uh, SMB sales or uh, IT sales, IT services to the SMB market. 24 years old, didn't know what I was doing. Took every training there was, Sandler, Miller, Hyman, Taz, you name it. Um, came across Basho, which was a training I took and I loved. Used it to help grow the company up. Uh, fastest growing company in Massachusetts for a few years in a row. Uh, sold off to Staples. Got acquired and then um, come to find out apparently I'm not a corporate guy and um, the Staples eventually offered me another position, which was a really nice way of firing me. And uh, then I was looking for a job and Basho said, John, you want to be a trainer? I said, no, uh, I don't like trainers. I, most trainers I know are either failed sales professionals or professional presenters. And so, um, but they said, don't worry, you have to use these techniques to sell so you can train. And I like that. Joined them, brought on some bigger accounts, took on some bigger ones. And then uh, long story short, they screwed it all up and I took it all over. And then uh, about four years ago, went off on my own. And so now I train Salesforce, LinkedIn, Box, Dropbox, Aptis, you know, a lot of the SaaS companies, mostly in San Francisco, even though I'm based here in Boston. And, you know, and I'm a, I'm, I always say I'm not a really a trainer. I'm a sales guy that came across some really good stuff. And it happen, I happen to be okay sharing it with people. So um, that's what I do. I, I, I try to help reps skip a few steps because now at 40 years old, you know, if it, you know, if I could go back and tell my 22 year old self something, I tell myself a lot. And so that's what I try to incorporate a lot into this training. I think a really remarkable thing about your training that, that I think is, is pretty unique is that just like you said, you're you're a salesperson talking to other salespeople, and so yes. it's incredibly practical. I love I love a lot of the, the the you've got a pretty good pulse on software and mm -hmm. what's working and what's not, and so I really really love that because it's I mean you can go in and you can implement a lot of the stuff that you're talking about in your trainings mm -hmm. immediately. Yeah. That's the key. Yeah. I mean, to me, that's why in training, when I say I don't, I never really like sales trainers is because it was all role play based or it was all theory and, and, you know, so much fluff, you know, the fact that you have to most sales training, right. You sit through an entire day of sales training and, you know, if you get one or two nuggets out of it, you're thrilled. And to me, that's insulting. Um, you know, so I, I take what sh should have been three or what was three days worth of training and cut it down to one or and then instead of role play, it's like, let's do this. Like, here's how to send an email. Now, let's send an email right? Um, instead of, hey, you know, why don't you let's role play this? I think that's just ridiculous. Yeah. I'm really curious to know at what point, John, in your sales career, did you realize that you were actually really good at, at what you did was it was it one of your first sales jobs or did it take a while for you to to, to kind of discover that uh i mean i was always top of the list um dewalt uh you know but it was it was always weird to me because i i didn't understand why because i thought it was just really work ethic i think you know i'm not the natural born sales rep by any stretch of the imagination i'm not that know exactly what to say how to say it when to say it type of person i think there's probably two percent of our population that are like that um i have to work my ass off in sales and thankfully however my parents did it they instilled a very pretty a pretty strong work ethic in me and so for instance when i was at xerox you know i was getting a ton of smoke blown up my ass about how great i was and all this other stuff and i'm sitting there going uh like why i'm i'm literally just doing what you're asking me to do like i'm doing more than what you're out you know i'm showing but i'm showing up you know early i'm staying late i'm working hard i'm trying to hit my number i don't understand why you think this is extraordinary here and and that is unfortunately the sad state of affairs in sales is i think most sales reps are fucking lazy and and the work ethic isn't there people say you got to work smart bullshit you have to work hard and smart and right. and i think my what my realization was earlier in my career was I just worked harder than everybody else. And so that's what really drove my success, not necessarily my sales abilities. And I I'm not a good liar. And 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 so I'm a pretty transparent seller. And I think that has been a, a huge benefit to me over the years because I never tried to trick somebody or or say something to get them to do something that they didn't need to do. I just asked a very direct question. And again, to me, it was, it, 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 I never really 
it never really registered that that was actually what it takes to be great in sales is is being very direct knowing exactly what your product does knowing exactly what you know asking the right questions and making the match and when there's not a match there's not a match you 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 walk away from it and you hold your integrity high i'd rather lose a deal because of integrity than win one because i i was i, I used a cool technique that convinced people to do something else and so that's kind of my realization not necessarily that i'm that great in sales it's just i think people have a different perception of what greatness is so that's interesting because I think you bring up a good point and I know it's something you're super passionate around which is the, Hey, I'm checking in and uh, I'm just touching base and yeah, and I, I'm sure you're going to get in a passion rant, which I love getting fired yeah. up. Um, yeah. But I think it's one of those things where this persistence and you have this, I want to keep doing what I'm doing every day and I want to, mm -hmm. don't want to work hard, but you're saying it's, I got to know when to walk away. So is that mm -hmm. what, is that what drives the, Hey, I'm just checking in or, or what drives that? And why are you, why are you on the mission to get rid of that? Well, I mean, I think just in general, reaching out to people, I mean, it's just like your friends or your parents or anybody, let's put it into that context. Like when your mom calls you up and is like, Hey, how you doing? What you been up to? You're like, you know, right. ma, what, why are you calling me? Right? Like, yeah. you know, that's why I, the good news that I didn't, I recommend this to everybody, by the way, I've structured with my parents. I call them once a week on Monday night at six o'clock. So they know when that <laughs> call is coming because it, before that it was literally calling me in the middle of the day, just to check in. And, and it drove me nuts. And I think it's yeah. the same thing with clients. Like when you check in and touch base and stuff like that, that means there's literally no reason for you to call. Right. And so therefore there's no reason for me to talk to you. And if you're not, I think the two things that need to be in place whenever you reach out to anybody, and I don't care whether this is an existing account, a new account, uh, you know, an inbound lead or an outbound lead, you, you have to, you have to have a reason for your call and you have to add value in some way, shape or form, because if you're not adding value, the most valuable asset any of us have is time. So it's the one thing we can't get back. And so if you want my time, it's going to be pretty damn obvious that what that, that by that voicemail or that email that I'm going to get value out of calling you back because right. if not, don't bother. And that's why, you know, tips, nuggets, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of instead of saying touching base and checking in. So instead of just railing on stuff that people do bad, you know, a thing that I've used to replace that and train on is just start literally every conversation off with the reason for my call is. Yeah. Because if you can't finish that sentence, you should not be making the phone call. Yeah. I think it's a great, a great thing, especially when you're early in your career of just the reason for my call is X, Y, Z thing. And, and, and it changes the way you look at every conversation you're going into. Yeah. There's actually psychology around that too. Like one of my favorite books is Influence by Robert Cialdini. Mm -hmm. And he talks about how, you know, giving people reasons, they, they, they're more willing to accept it, right? Like if you just go do something, like if you just cut in front of somebody in line, and don't yeah. say anything they're pissed but if you give them a reason why you're cutting in line hey i'm sorry i'm just really busy do you mind hey i'm parked out front my kit whatever it's not that they're happy about it it's just that they're way more right. accepting of it right I, I think i remember reading through that example that you're you're referring to it was it was the photocopier yeah. study yeah. so um people were less likely to allow someone to cut if if they just asked hey do you do you mind if i cut in but mm -hmm. they were much more likely to cut in or, or to allow someone to cut in if they gave a reason. And yep. even if it was no reason at all, hey, can I cut in line because I need to cut in line? Right. Uh, people were still <laughs> willing, they found in the study, to let, let the person cut in line. So it's, it's really yep. interesting when you give that reason. Absolutely. Um, you talk about triggers a lot. Um, mm -hmm. and, and this is kind of in line with, with uh, not replacing checking in and touching base. Um, what are triggers and how can they be used effectively in, in a prospecting or calling strategy? Yeah. I mean, the triggers are the reasons. Uh, and I think, you know, and if anybody's read trigger, there's, there's tons of, you know, trainers out there that talk about trigger based selling. Um, and really all it is, is looking for things that you can make a connection to about your solution, not just in general, but hey, you know, if somebody launches a new product or opens up a new office or goes through a merger and acquisition or even says something, right? There's a tweet or a post or a blog where somebody references, hey, you know, here's our goals for next year or here's some of the challenges that we're faced with or hey, one of my favorite things is X, you know, that to me is a trigger that I can then use to reach out to that person. And, and it's all about relevance, right? And I think that's where the automation falls apart because you can't automate relevance 
you, you, you take a guess at relevance when you automate because you're saying, okay, maybe you fit this persona, you fit this role. So I think based on that, you know, this might hit that button, but really it does, you know, the, the fake personalization stuff is really pissing me off and we can talk about that later, but the, the actual personalization of reaching out and saying, Hey, you know, I, I saw this happen about you and, and I wanted to reach out to you because some aspect of my solution or whatever it is adds value to that and we've done it for other people and and i'd just like to have a conversation to see if yep. we can help move the dial here right and so that's why i think searching for those triggers is so important because it just it gives you that reason it gives you that relevance so question for you on that so how do you how do you scale that and how do you use it to avoid call reluctance that happens a lot of times where it's i gotta do research before i i call this person right how do you how do you avoid that well, you do need to do research. I mean, so this is kind of the, the, I think the conundrum that sales reps are in right now and organizations are in right now, because we're in this middle ground of still having a heavy focus on SDR, BDR roles or whatever, um, and still activity driven in the sense of, I want my sales reps to hit $50 a day, $100 a day. You have to send out a hundred emails. And, and to me, that's a, that's a very, we're, we're in, we're in a dangerous spot right now because because marketing automation is doing that better than we are and and i personally do not understand why if i was a vp of sales walking into an organization right now if all my sdrs bdrs are doing are cranking out template emails and making generic cold calls to hit 50 dials my first course of action is literally fire every single one of them go hire a marketing consultant for eloqua marketo you name the marketing automation tool tweak the shit out of it and then and then you know fake personalize it and go and save a shitload of money and probably drive better results and right. so so that's really where i think the danger of of but you know but then you tell the rep so we have to hit those numbers but then you tell them to be customized and then, you, then the reps swing the pendulum from one to the next. And when they say, okay, I got to do research, then they spend a half hour, 45 minutes, an hour before they make that phone call, which is wrong too. Because, right. you know, you guys know the stats probably better than I do. You know, I've seen the studies on how many touches it takes to get in touch with somebody, right? It's five touches, 10 touches, 20 touches, whatever the number is, it's more than one. Right. And so that that statistic alone tells you it's not worth writing, you know, spending a half an hour to do research. So to me, it's it's going back to this this conversation. The premise of this is professional persistence. It's not about the one email, the one voicemail. It's about the contact strategy. And so how do you how do you do personalization at scale? Well, you know, it's. It's first of all, segmenting out your territory to understand which ones you actually should be focusing on with a customized approach and which ones you shouldn't. You know, you got your tier one, tier two, and tier three accounts. Your tier ones are the ones you should be doing that for. Your tier twos and your tier threes, you shouldn't. You should automate that stuff. Yeah. yeah. So once you identify those tier ones, then, okay, listen to them. Right. Those yeah. are the tools, right? Those are the, all the technologies we can use, the owlers of the world, the, the Google alerts of the world, the sales navigator yeah. stuff of the world, so that you can listen to them and pick up on that stuff. And then I recommend doing more of a kind of a morning routine scenario where every morning when you're drinking your coffee, instead of you checking your fantasy leagues or all that stupid shit, you know, you end up looking at data feeds and you just kind of look through and say, Ooh, there's something that just happened. Ooh, let me fire off a quick little email on that one. Right. And maybe only do an hour's worth of really, really high quality prospecting, um, right. a day and then do your quantity in the afternoon. And by the way, take a step back i'm i'm speaking it also is obviously directly relevant to what your role is and what you're selling you know if, you, if you're a major account rep and you have three accounts uh you better be doing all quality okay yeah you better be spending a half an hour looking through uh, an hour looking through that 10k annual report really understanding that business if you're an sdr and you're focusing on a, a 1000 you know acv you know what I mean? Like that's volume. Like right. there's somebody asked me when I was at Dreamforce on a panel, they said, is, is blast emailing dead? And I'm like, well, no, it's not. It's, it's, it works for those, in, you know, certain industries right. it really does. But, but if you're really, if you're going mid market or above and you have a targeted approach and you have a somewhat of a complex product, you gotta have that quantity, that quality in there. What, what happens if you introduce things like uh, artificial intelligence, Conversica type type stuff, type software to the mix. Um, 
how, how does how, how can you work that in you know to personal intentional follow up and how does that fit in with like the automated marketing type stuff as well yeah that's the that's again that's that danger the danger zone that we're in right now i think i, th I think the the piece that you know, we were talking about this with the Tesla, right? Like I, I, I get freaked out, but I don't want to, I, I'm a control freak, right? I, I don't want a car driving for me. That, that creeps me out. Um, I also am not a huge fan of where we are right now with artificial intelligence, because what artificial intelligence is starting to try to do is say, hey, you should reach out. This person kind of is at this stage and they just did these things. You know, marketing automation is they clicked on this and here's a score you should call them. Artificial intelligence is more along, hey, you should call this person because this is where they are in the sales stage process and, and you should say this to them, right? You know, I mean, I think if we think of the sales, um, the sales industry and the average sales rep, I think maybe some of them do need to be told what to do, but then that just gets us out of the, that, the, then what value do we bring to the table? And, and so I think that if, you know, on the, the old age uh, analogy that you got to use and, and more than a few people have used this one. So it's not nothing new for me. It's, it's, it's the whole Iron Man thing, right? It's like, you know, Tony Stark as an individual, you know, there's no way, you know, he's, he's got it all right. As a human being, he's, he's good looking, he's rich, he's, you know, he's super smart, but as a human, he, he'd get his ass kicked out there if, if he was out there fighting those villains. So what does he have to do? He has to create the suit, right? So the suit plus Tony, now you have, you have Iron Man, you can go whoop some ass, but you don't want a bunch of Iron Man drones that are flying around there because then you can't control them either. And, and the, and the last piece I'll kind of mention on this, and I think this is very important. Um, and it's what I picked up from Gary Vaynerchuk is the whole content versus context. And this is where I think humans still have the advantage. AI is starting to creep up on this, on us with this seasons and looking and putting context around it you know gary says you know everybody talks about content is king content is king it's like okay fine if content is king then context is god and to me i made that you know i made the connection there between sales and marketing marketing is content sales is context if you are not putting any context around the content you are no different than marketing and i have no idea why you're getting paid commissions you know a couple of examples here it drives me batshit crazy when somebody just retweets a 39 page ebook. You're like, oh, really good 39 page ebook here. It's like, do you know how many 39 page ebooks I have in my things to read folder that I've never <laughs> opened, by the way? Um, but if a rep were to retweet it and say, hey, really good 39 page ebook here, um, you know, if, if you're a VP of sales in the SaaS industry trying to integrate social selling, you should take a look at pages 30, you know, 26 through 35. And this is why. This is why I think it's important. Um, webinars, right? You know, I sign up for hundreds of webinars. I don't attend any of them. You know why? Because I know right after that webinar, I'm going to get that email. Sorry, you missed the webinar. Here's the link and whatever. And it's going to go to my things to read folder. I'll never look at it. But if a rep would ever take two seconds and say, Hey John, I saw you signed up for that webinar. I noticed you missed it. Um, based on what I know about you, if you start listening to this webinar from minute 30, you know, 22 to 36, that's really where I think the value is here. And this is why I thought you might get them. Now you put context around it. You've saved me time. You've built your brand. That's why those template emails, that's content, right? Yeah. The customization components about why it's relevant to them is the context. I and that's what I think that. is. Right. I, I absolutely love that. And I, I agree with you 100%. And this, this, I mean, it's one of the problems with, with Twitter right now. It's just a massive fire hose of people. I've pretty much given up on Twitter. Yeah. No, I'm not kidding. <laughs> it's insane. Like I hook it, I hook it to buffer and I'm like, yeah, I tweet something out there just in case somebody follows it. But I, I you know, as far as Twitter as a means of communication, I, I'm sick of it. I want to, I want to jam on that a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Why is it that people are more responsive to someone taking the time to do something like that. Hey, I think you should yeah. take a look at this page one, or mm -hmm. I think you should take a look at minute five because it's going to be really relevant to you. Right. I, I mean, just because it, it's, uh, I mean, I'll, the only thing I care about is me. Yeah. All right. I mean, let's, let's put it, 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 you know, I, you know, I talk about this as, you know, any country I go to and train in, you know, I, I ask the question, what's the number one thing that everybody loves talking about? 
and always every end is myself right and so if you put something templated out there that isn't for me i don't care about it you know that's why going back to you know the the nuances here you know if 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 it isn't blatantly obvious to me literally in the first sentence that you've done some homework on me i i do not read the email now mind you you could even customize it later but if that first part isn't customized i delete it out of the gate so in mails right because the thing that you see on your is is the first couple of lines on an yeah. email uh emails you see it on your iphone if it even if it's one of those hey you know research says that you know one of these gartner reports or something like that and it starts with that but then goes and john the reason i wanted to send this to you was because i don't get to that part because it doesn't you know and i go back to old school glenn gary grin ross and you guys heard this in my training you know aida right attention interest desire action 1898 st elmo lewis came up with that those are the four mental stages we need to go through before we buy something so first something needs to get our attention then we have to be interested then we have to have a desire it takes seconds to get someone's to win or lose someone's attention. And in that two, five to 15 seconds, that earns us an extra couple of minutes where we can say something that might get them interested. And then that earns us, you know, the next action or whatever it is. And so that's why, why you're to your question of why is it relevant? Because I care about me and I don't have time. And so the template stuff, I disregard because it's just so noisy and I hear so much about that and they all sound exactly the same. They're all, they all have the same fucking format and temp, you know what I mean? And, but if all of a sudden I see some kid took literally five seconds and went on a blog post of mine and said, John, I, you know, I really like your blog on professional persistence. I wanted to be professionally persistent reaching out to you, you know, like, okay, cool. I'll give you credit here, kid. Right. Um, same thing with training, same thing with, I mean, presentations, demo, I hate demos. I <laughs> hate demos because most demos, hey, John, thanks for your time today. So I'm going to go through about a 30 minute demo here. And if you have any questions uh, as we go through it, just let me know. Okay. And then wah, they just press play <laughs> and it's like, you know, and everybody has the two screens. I got mine right here. And as soon as I can tell that demo is not relevant to me or it's not, and you haven't engaged me and why I should care about this demo. I go from this screen to this screen. I put you on mute and I start checking my emails. It's just the way it works. I think this is, um, I think it's human nature to, to respond or feel obligated to respond when you feel like someone is talking directly to you. And I've used this example of, you know, John, you probably come across this quite a bit. And when you're on stage, you're talking to a group of people. And if you ask a question to the group of people, you're not expecting every single one of them to respond with their answer, right? Because it's, it's a bit rhetorical and it's meant for a general audience. However, if you get face to face with them and you ask them that same question, they're going to respond, right? And so I think human, human nature is to look for that personal communication. In fact, I, I got it this morning. I got a, a cold email um, asking, it was some content marketer, and it, I, I actually started typing out a response, and then I put it on hold because I wanted to kind of wait. Uh, but but I, I'm going to respond because it actually looks like he took the time, sort of, to yeah. uh to, to look at our website and and see you know if what he provides is relevant to us yeah and, and i think that you know i'm going to go back to the to the premise of this of this whole you know thing that we're doing right here in the podcast is the professional persistence and i think if you know what what this came from was that that blog post that i wrote and you know it really i can't think of the last time so i i can you know there's there's i've got a few examples of somebody who's reached out to me once with a customized email, right? With a, Hey John, I read your blog or I see, you know, see so you're doing this stuff. I can't tell you the last time that somebody's actually reached out to me more than three or four times with a thoughtful, uh, story to tell where it wasn't, Hey, did you get my first email? Did you get my second email? Hey, bubbling this one up to the top. Hey. Uh, and then the inevitable breakup email, you know, the fucking alligator bullshit one. That's like, Oh, you know, you're stuck under a rock or you're eaten by an alligator. Or you, you know, it's like, ugh. and if anybody's listening to this, please just don't send that stupid email again. Um, so, I mean, that, that's my, you know, it, you know, in, in talking about professional person, tell a story. I just literally tell a story. Don't throw up on me about all the one. Assume that your first email isn't going to get read, 
right? So what's that next one? What's that next one? And that's why I recommend to reps, you know, grab a few accounts every month, maybe if it's only five and sit down like really good accounts and sit down and think through what that contact strategy is going to look like and literally tell your story. Like what's that first email going to be? What's that second one? What's that third one? And make sure that there's some different piece of value and some different component of your solution that are relevant to me lined up in that. And I will promise you, you know, I've talked to more and more than a few executives who almost after that third, fourth, fifth one that are, that show that the reps really put the thought into it, they almost feel obligated to give that rep a call back to say, man, I don't even know we need what you have, but shit, man, you put in the effort here. I'm going to, I'll take the phone call. Sure. What? I think that brings up a good point. And actually, I, I got a question from uh, one of our Real Sales Talk fans, and he wanted me to let you know he was, uh, he was one of your Snapchat disciples, <laughs> Lee, Liam Todd. He's out of the UK. Uh, okay. He's got a question relevant to this that I thought this would be appropriate time to ask. So he says, is it safe to make a second attempt with a prospect a few months after them saying they are not interested right now? And what's the best way to get the conversion rate, the conversation going again? Um, yes, I think it's totally safe, but it depends. Something has had to have changed in some way, shape or form. You know what I mean? Like if they're like, Hey, I'm not interested right now because nothing bothers me more than for me to tell a sales rep, look, dude, like I, I, I like what you're saying here. I got a million other priorities on my plate right now. So this isn't, you know, I'm interested, but not right now. So reach out to me in three months or something like that. And then they're like, but, 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 I mean, then I, okay, then don't reach out to me in three months, piss off. So, um, but if somebody does reach out to me after I say that and they can, they bring something new to the table where something either they, again, they looked at, they, they were following me and they saw a trigger. They saw me say something or, or something happened with my business or something, a, they evolved as a business, like they added a new service or a new product or something like that to their solution that aligns more with what they know about me, right? That is totally appropriate. And I, and I think this also goes to a theme of what I really do believe our job has shifted into right now as sales professionals, which is it's not to educate our clients on our services and our products. Like the information's out there. They can find it out if they want to. Mm -hmm. um, our job in sales is to get the prospect to think. And I mean that in, in the way of, you know, and it's not a short term thing here either. You know, this is why I think social selling is so important and me sharing, you know, the whole challenger lead with insights. I don't think, you know, the, the, where I differ with challenger is they say that lead with an insight and always tie it back to you, right? It's like, Hey, here's this report and here's how we can then execute on that for you. I disagree with that. I, I, I don't think it always has to come back to you. I think you could share something with somebody that, that, is not about you, but gets them to think and, and have no expectation of them saying, Hey, yeah, let's talk about that. But you know, it's like, Hey, you know, I remember we talked about three months ago and one of the things, one of the priorities you said was this, and actually I've been, I've been following you or I noticed this trend in the industry that's happening that actually might impact that. And I thought you might find this interesting. Uh, here you go. Right. So it's more of the education view of it. And then if you have something to then, ask them about like if something fundamentally changed right where you saw me post a blog about professional persistence you know what i mean like say say i talk to you about uh you know hey i'm doing sales whatever it is and things are going on i'm super busy right now and you're like john i got this i got this uh say you're you know tout app send bloom pick pick one of them right and one of those contact strategy things and i'm like look i'm not ready for you right now and then two months later i write a blog post about professional persistence and you then reach out to me and say, Hey, John, I know you, you know, I've been keeping up to date with you. Um, I actually noticed your recent blog post about professional persistence. You know, you know, a lot of what our platform does is actually helps monitor and track and manage professional persistence without taking the, the personality out of it. And I was wondering if this might be a better time to reconnect now that, you know, I'll shit. Yeah, man, I'll take that phone call. Yeah. So question for you. So one of the pushbacks I would get from a BDR team I've managed is, okay, great. So I'm going to give you this insightful thing and I'm going to drop it in your inbox. So I'm not going to go for the ask. Yep. Oh, like I'm not, I got to get paid. I got to get paid this month. It's yeah. going to take too long. What's, what's your, what's your pushback? Uh, it goes back to the segmentation. It goes back to I, my probably pushback to that rep would be you suck at time management. <laughs> um, 
So let's talk about that. But I think it, it, it's, it's compartmentalize it. Again, don't do this for everybody. Pick right. some accounts that you really want to get into. What are those logos? And if you're not doing it for those, what are you doing? You know what I mean? Like if you're, if, yeah. if you have a really that ideal customer profile that all the ABM and ABS, you know, stuff is talking, you know, account-based marketing, account-based selling stuff is talking about. If you have that list of, Ooh, here's my top 10 or Ooh, here's my top 25. And you're not doing that for them, then take them off your top 25. Don't have a top 25. Right. So that that's where I would say, I would say, look, don't do this to your tier two and tier three accounts. It's not, it is, you're right. It's not worth it. Right. But you better be doing this to your tier one accounts or, you know, and you can also look at this as internally within an organization, tearing out your contacts of the C levels and the VPs. Those are your tier ones, the directors and your managers. Those are your tier twos and the, you know, end users are your tier threes. Sure. If you want to blast out some emails to end users, just, you know, cause you got a, you know, seed and grow approach, go for it. You know, if you wanted to, if you wanted to kind of tailor your approach to a group of managers to say, Hey, look, this is what we help managers do, then go ahead. But if you're going after that CEO or that VP of sales and you want that response, you better, you better step up. Yeah, absolutely. You talk a lot about, um, go starting from the top and working down. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about why why you think that that's valuable and and some things that that sales reps should consider when doing that? Yeah, actually, my my thought process on on this has changed um, relatively recently over the past couple of years. You know, I used to be a hundred percent top down, right? This is what Basho taught me, which is and and it was weird because I used to sell to the SMB market. And, you know, I actually had no problems going after a CEO, a CFO of a small business. But then I joined Basho and they said, John, your target audience is Salesforce and like, you know, Michael Dell. And, it, and so you need to reach out to Mark Benioff. And, like, and I'm like, why the hell would I reach out to those? Like, what, what am I going to say to them? Right. Um, but, you know, back then, eight, nine years ago, I could, you know, you could reach out to them and say, and the whole concept was, hey, here's what we do. You know, hey, I saw something about you, ideally. You know, I did some research. I saw this. Um, here's, you know, the reason I wanted to reach out to you is because of this. You know, who can I talk to about that? And the concept there was you get the referral down and then your chances of getting the meeting with that person are way higher because their boss told them to do it, right? Um, as opposed to the bottom up approach, which is takes a long time or the directly at you approach, right? I sell to VPs, we, you know, you guys sell to VPs of sales all day long, right? You know, we, the VPs of sales hear the same damn thing over and over and over again, right? But if I go after a CEO, don't sell them, say something cool enough to get their attention and they say, who can I respond? Then my chances are higher. Problem is, is that there's, and I, I'm not going to name the trainings, um, name any names here, but there's a very popular uh, book and training that now advocates and has kind of bastardized that approach. And what they do is they send a very short and sweet to the point email that says, hey, here's a one or two liner of what we do. Here's three clients we work with. Who can I talk to about this? And it's, and then they litter the C-suite. And then they, they, they don't care about conversion ratios. All they care about is once they get the response of who that referral is, then they go all in on that, right? And so what that's done is that's really hurt the top-down approach. I mean, I was doing a training the other day. It was a sales kickoff, and there was about 200 reps in the uh, the 300 reps in this auditorium. And, and, I'm, and I'm starting to talk about top-down. And literally, the CEO of the company is sitting front row, steps up and says, stands up and says, I'm calling bullshit on the top-down approach. And I'm like... <laughs> Okay, this is gonna this is gonna be awkward. Um, I'm like, all right, let's talk. Come on up here. Let's let's have this discussion. He's like, I get forty to fifty emails a day from sales reps saying, you know, blah blah blah. Who can I talk to about this, right? And he's like, I don't respond to any of them. I think they're all bullshit. I'm like, okay. I go, let me ask you. It, are those forty to fifty emails? Do they pretty much say it's a short, sweet, to the point email that says, hey, here's here's a one liner what we do. Here's three clients we work with. Who can I talk to about this? He says, yes, absolutely, every one of them. And I go, okay. If somebody actually were to go on your annual report on your 10K, sift through and look at some of your priorities and customize an email to you and send it off, would you pay attention to that one? He's like, oh yeah, well, yeah absolutely. I'm like, okay, well, he, therein lies the problem, is that the top down approach only really works when there's relevance. And, and also what the guy brought up, and this is something for th for the viewers here is also when it's blatantly fucking obvious who the best person is to speak with, don't <laughs> ask. Like the, the CEO stood up and he's like, you know, what drives me crazy. He's like, Hey, we got this great HR software. That's super cool. And does all this awesome HR stuff. CEO, who can I talk to about this in your organization? The CEO's like, 
My fucking HR director. What are you, an idiot? <laughs> like, like, look on LinkedIn for two seconds. You know what I mean? I, and I think so when it's when it's blatantly obvious who the best person is to speak with, don't do it. Go after the person who's the best. Now, go after that chain. You know what I mean? Like, if you have an HR solution, maybe go after the CFO with that, right? Because usually HR reports to CFOs and say, hey, from a CFO standpoint, you know, who's the best person on your team to talk to about this? But don't go after a CIO with an HR solution and say, who's the best for, you know, that type of thing. Um, and, and, you know, if you're going to go up that high, you better be damn sure that, that you've done your homework before, you know, and I talk about speaking the language of the people that you want to talk to understanding what CEOs and healthcare industries care about and why they care about it. You know, those type of things, because if you can't speak that language, do not expect them to respond. Very good. John dropping tons of knowledge. Uh, we have 10 more minutes left. Yep. Um, how can I consume more content? So if they don't have enough, I want more. How can I consume more of your content? And then maybe even how can we hire you if, uh, if we, if we want to hear that bad. Yeah, no, no, I appreciate it. Um, I think it's, um, you know, you just go to my website. It's, uh, I mean, and Sean knows this, the Snapchat world too. I'm on there. I answer questions all the time on Snapchat. So if you got a question, you want to hit me up, um, you'll find me in some random airport doing some dumb shit. i um, happy to chat anytime. Uh, my website, I try to put as much of my stuff out there for free as I can. So um, for instance, if you go to jbarrows.com and you hit on uh, the upper right hand corner of the resource center, the resource library, I'd say like 80% of the stuff I put out there, tips, nuggets, videos, all that stuff I put out there for free. And then obviously I have my online portal that has my core content, like what I train on. You can buy that. Uh, and I can always show up on site if you want to hit me up with an email. So, and I'm, you know, like I said, I'm, I, I just like talking sales just like this. So, and, and I always say it's, it's more about, you know, giving information and it all comes back around. So, you know, if I can help out with a nugget or a tip or share an idea or something like that, I'm, I'm happy to do it. Awesome. I've seen I've seen you do that pretty frequently uh, on Snapchat where you're you know you've got a layover or something like that and you're like hey you know send me your sales questions and and you actually yeah, get fun. quite a few I think yeah I do there's a decent amount of reps I mean not as not as many as I uh, you know I I mean you know Snapchat's an interesting thing I'm still I'm still trying to figure it out um, but uh, it's and and also all the different mediums of different ways that people are are, are communicating. Um, and different ways of communicating with them. So, yeah, I mean, I'm up for anything. Email, uh, John at Jay Barrows, uh, Snapchat, Twitter, even though I'm not too paying too much attention to that anymore. Uh, <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious to know, maybe maybe one of the last questions here from me, uh, what yeah. are some of the uh, tools, resources, books that you're really, really into or maybe some that you've recently gotten into that you would recommend to sales reps? Um, yeah, so... I mean, the tools, you know, I love Owler, um, O-W-L-E-R, that it's free. I, I like a lot of the free stuff. Um, you know, there's there's obviously the tools you pay for, but uh, I'm cheap, so. Um, but like the Owlers of the world, um, I love Crystal Nose. Crystal Nose blows my mind. You know, that's the whole personality profile thing and understanding what the personality of that person is as you're reaching out to them. Um, you know, and, and then the books, I actually, there was something that Gary V, um, there's a book that he talked about recently about kind of the future of social. Uh, and I thought it was super interesting. I haven't read it yet, but, um, it's on my list. I'll see That's if interesting. He doesn't normally talk about books because he doesn't read them. So, right. Well, he had this guy on who's like this social guru or something like that. And oh, it, yeah. and it, and it, and the way he talked about it, I actually sent it to my, uh, my group that, that were, that I work with and support. I'm like, I, we have to read this because it was talking about the social organism. It's called, yeah, it's called the social organism um, by Oliver Luckett. Um, I, I haven't read it yet, um, but uh, I've seen I've seen enough to say, whoop, uh, that's probably something I should be paying attention to. Um, I'm reading some stuff. I, it, I'm more of a blog reader, so it's not like I'm not a book reader. I'm more of a snippets and blog reader. So, you know, the, the sales for life, the you know, um, HubSpot sales blog, I think is fantastic. Um, Steve Richards doing some really cool stuff over at exec vision with call recording and, and listening in. Um, so those are the types of people and, and information. And I really recommend by the way, that everybody out there in sales right now, uh, really start paying attention to artificial intelligence, uh, and virtual reality, I, virtual reality and artificial intelligence 
in the next five years are going to fundamentally shift everything that we do in, in, in our world, period, but, may, but also have a very direct and um, potentially scary impact uh, in sales. So if you're doing nothing else right now in sales, um, really pay attention to artificial intelligence and, and, and where it's going and what it's doing. Uh, IBM Watson is a client of mine and, and the, the reason they are a client of mine is because I wrote a blog post and I said IBM Watson in my blog post and all of a sudden 30 seconds later I got an email from a VP of sales at IBM Watson and it scared the shit out of me. <laughs> um, and so, um, so yeah, those are, those are things I would recommend at least paying attention to and then just always improve your craft. I don't care what it is. You know, I'll leave, I'll leave with this unless you get another question, but it's, you know, the, I live by the rule of 1%, which is just every day, try to get 1% better. Right. And, and, and whether that's making that extra phone call, reading that extra blog post, you know, uh, asking that extra question, whatever it is, get better. Because if you know, you know, somebody asked me a while back, John, you know, customers are getting so much more knowledgeable about this and information's out there. It's like, what are we supposed to do with sales reps? If they're getting better, what are we supposed to do? And I, 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 I try to say no, there's no stupid questions. Um, that was a stupid question because my, my, my response to it was you get better. I, I, yeah. I don't know what to tell you. Like if, if they're getting better, you got to get better or go find another job. So I, I think that's the, you know, the idea of why I pay attention to the stuff I pay attention to. It's awesome. I think, I think you stole my question. I love it. So I'm i uh, I'm going to uh, wrap up. Cool. cool, John. Well, we really, really appreciate it. It's been fun jamming with you today, and you've offered some really, really great takeaways. Looking forward to getting this one out and into the hands of our Real Sales Talk audience. So um, on behalf of all of, our, all of our Real Sales Talk family and followers, uh, we appreciate you being on today. Awesome. I appreciate you guys having me, and anytime you want to wrap, I'm, I'm all in, all right? Sweet. Cool. Thanks, Thanks so much. Guys. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week for another episode of Real Sales Talk.